Uh, so thank you everybody for coming this morning or this afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Um, and as Brenda mentioned, this is the third in a series of what I think will be four uh, presentations. And if you're involved in laying hen production and management, you know how complicated it is and there's a lot of moving parts. And, and um, one of the things that I wanna stress is that um, there are several stages over the life of a flock, obviously. Um, but sometimes what we, we forget about is that each one is dependent on the previous ones. And although we have specific objectives and specific requirements, it's really building on the solid foundation that hopefully we built in, um, in the previous uh, uh, segments or previous parts of the, the flock life. So we've talked about pullets, um, which I've considered zero to 13 weeks of age. And then we talked about transition to lay, and that's based morally on, more on uh, changes in physiology uh, than on you know, moving from a, a pullet barn to a layer barn necessarily. And so today we're gonna focus on peak production and, and what comes after peak production um, and what we mean by peak production and how that influences how we feed birds. Um, I'll give a little bit of a, a preview about uh, phytase in, in laying hen diets because I think it's a, it's a misunderstood topic. And then uh, coming up in the future, and we haven't decided exactly when, uh, we'll talk about persistency to the end of the production cycle and uh, the cumulative effects of long-term egg production. So today we're going to focus on um, what I'm calling peak production and the, the beginning of persistency. So again, just to summarize what we've talked about already, uh, we've talked about in the pullet rearing, really the focus is growth and development, particularly of the digestive tract and the immune system and feathers and muscles. Uh, and some advice that I gave was to listen to what the bird is telling you, because the bird will not lie. Uh, the management guide is a good source of information. Um, it helps you to understand what you're trying to do with each particular point. But if you view the management guide as the rule book and on a particular day of age, you must do certain things. You're, you're missing the point of how you should be using the management guide. So listen to what the bird is telling you in terms of nu nutrient supply and management techniques. And so uh, the goal is to maintain good body weight and, and body composition, uh, to maintain good flock uniformity and also skeletal development. And so we need to pay attention to those details because the success that we have or don't have in the pullet phase is going to carry over into the layer barn and either make things easier to deal with or, or more difficult to deal with in the layer barn. Uh, we talked about body weight and composition. I recommend that uh, the bird should be on target or slightly above. And that means um, frequent weighing of the birds to make subtle changes to management um, and also fleshing. So uh, looking at what the bird is uh, depositing in terms of that body weight gain. So is it fat? Is it protein? Is it skeletal structure? And so on. Uh, we talked about ways to encourage feed intake, uh, the use of fiber to strategically increase gut capacity, uh, stack feeding, training the birds to eat more frequent meals, and some strategies if the birds are underweight. So delay feeding changes, manage stress uh, like vaccinations. And if you need to, you can return to an earlier diet phase with a higher nutrient density. Um, and if the birds reach the so-called target age of photostimulation and they're still underweight or under conditioned, you can delay photostimulation to make sure that the birds have the nutrient reserves that they need. We talked about the importance of uniformity. And really what we want is every single bird in that flock to have exactly the same nutrient requirements because um, if, they, if they are exactly the same, uh, they will respond to our changes in management and changes in feeding and photostimulation in exactly the same way. Obviously that's not possible, but we want the birds to be as uniform as possible. We talked about the transition period and the start of sexual maturation process into early egg production. Um, and so, um, this is uh, usually from uh, 13 to 20 weeks of age. Uh, the ovary starts to develop the reproductive tract. There's more muscle and secondary sexual characteristic development. And we talked about the deposition of medullary bone. And during this time, uh, structural bone deposition decreases. So really what we want to uh, accomplish in the, this transition period is to continue with the end goals in mind. We want to manage these birds so that by the time they get to the end of the production cycle, um, they're, they're really uh, well set up for um, 
uh, success in the long run. So make your management decisions that are going to lead to success in the long run and not just focus on minimizing short-term costs because saving money in the short term might cost you money in the long term. So view the poet as an investment. Uh, and again, carry on your, your good management techniques that you started uh, in the earlier pullet phase. Um, delay photostimulation if needed. Um, change feeding composition uh, diet phases based on what the birds actually require and not the management diet. And really what you're trying to do is set the bird up for that maturation, that estrogen surge that's going to move her into uh, from the pullet phase into, uh, into the delaying phase. And that estrogen surge is going to depend not only on age, but also on body weight and body composition. So it's really important. And we want to make sure that the birds also have sufficient time to develop medullary bone before the first egg, because this is going to support eggshell formation throughout the life of the bird. Okay, so that's kind of a summary of where uh, we, we are at at this point. And so I want to move into the laying phase. And I've just arbitrarily de de uh, determined this to be uh, over about 20 weeks of age. So obviously the birds are going to start laying um, before 20 weeks of age, but really at this point, most of the birds, almost all of the birds in the flock should be in lay. Uh, at this point, if we've done a good job managing our pullets, they should be a very uniform flock. And there will be some development of the reproductive tract and also uh, body composition. So uh, some fat deposition, gradually occurring as the birds get older. There's also a little bit of protein deposition in the body and in the form of muscle. And remember that the birds are only going to be developing medullary bone once they reach sexual maturity. Now, it's a bit of a departure for me, so I'm not going to talk a lot about bones in today's talk, and I'll come back in, in our subsequent uh, final installment in this series and, and spend a lot of time talking about uh, bones. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of a bone, uh, a break from discussing bones uh, today. Okay, so what's the context? Now, globally, the industry is moving towards longer laying cycles with greater persistency. And, and perhaps the industry in Canada is um, a little bit behind the curve in that regard, but we still need to remember that the birds that we have, the genetics that we have, are selected based on that global market for a longer life cycle, a bird that can sustain high levels of egg production for a longer period of time. And you can see um, there's a couple of reasons why modern laying hens produce more eggs or are capable of producing more eggs. Uh, there's a slightly higher peak production if we look at percent production. Uh, there's greater persistency. And as we'll see in the next slide, that greater persistency uh, allows those birds to um, to stay in production uh, economically. And so this is from one of the primary breeders and, and it's probably a similar situation for just about every uh, one of the, um, of the, the layer strains. Uh, this graph compares um, brown laying hens in 1980. Uh, so if you look at uh, the green line, light green line, this is the percent production in 1980. A couple of things you can see that the, the onset of lay is shifted a little bit later. Uh, in the in the 1980 birds, and you'll and this is particularly important. You'll see that egg size, so average egg weight, continues to increase at a fairly rapid pace, and we'll talk about the implications of that uh, shortly. Now, if we look at the the 2020 brown laying hens, we can see they come into production uh, a couple of weeks earlier. They reach a higher peak production, uh, also reaching a little bit earlier. But one of the most important things for the persistency is that the primary breeders have selected for a very gradual increase in egg size. And so the reason that that is so important for, uh, for the, uh, the persistency of the birds is that as eggs or as the hens get older and as eggs get bigger, there's a limited ability of the hen to deposit eggshell. So um, essentially after peak production, the hens have a fixed amount of calcium that they can deposit onto an eggshell. And so as the egg gets bigger, that means there's more surface area that needs to be covered and eggshell quality tends to decline. So when egg production, or sorry, when egg weight continues to increase and increase and increase at a fairly rapid rate, it means shell quality comes down. And so one of the biggest things that has contributed to these longer life cycles uh, of laying hens is that 
a, a, a much more gradual increase in egg size means that the loss of shell quality takes much longer to happen. And so um, the birds are able to maintain high levels of egg production with good shell quality for a much longer period of time. So if we look at within a modern laying strain, and we've talked about the importance of, of pullet size, um, main, uh, achieving a good target body weight or slightly above the target body weight and body composition, um, there's a huge difference in the, uh, in the size of eggs uh, relative to body weight. And so we can see particularly early in life, 18 to 20 weeks of, uh, 28 weeks of age, um, differences in hen size have a huge impact on egg size. Now, we don't necessarily want the eggs to be as large as they possibly can early on because they will continue to increase in egg size. But I just want to emphasize the point that um, if we're managing our pullet flock properly, we can influence, first of all, the size of the eggs when the hens first come into production, uh, and then also manage the rate of increase in egg size as the birds get older. So the point is, if we have underweight pullets, um, we tend to have small early eggs. And so those small early eggs are worth less, not worthless, but they are worth less. Um, and that will continue throughout, uh, throughout the egg production cycle. Uh, Brenda and Val and I did a, a, a fairly large project probably about eight years ago now looking at the medium egg production. Um, and I know that some producers are uh, keeping their, their, their bird size a little bit small in order to manage uh, egg size throughout the production cycle. Um, and you know, if, if you're doing that, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, what the, the birds are capable of in terms of um, not having a rapid increase in egg size. So certainly, um, if you're making a strategic decision, just be aware of the implications of bringing those birds in underweight, because uh, the context is different today than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or um, uh, because of genetic selection. Okay, so when we're, when we're weighing birds, when we're feeding for body weight and composition in the pullets, uh, we weigh them frequently. We make our feeding decisions according to bird, uh, bird weight and body composition. Um, and we make our decisions about how we want to approach our target body weights based on what we want for egg size, recognizing that the bird's genetics have changed because that's going to influence economics and that's going to influence shell quality. So economics from the standpoint of the value of small and medium eggs versus large and extra large eggs and what the bird is capable in terms of managing. And so uh, we need to uh, keep that in mind. On the other hand, if we bring in the birds at too heavy a body weight, chances are we may run into um, shell quality problems at the end because there, there, are, um, there are increases in egg size as the birds get older. And I've showed this graph before, but it's difficult to change the body weight trajectory when the birds are in lay. So once they come into production, if they're small birds, they will gain weight, but they will tend to be smaller birds throughout production. If they come in heavy, they will also gain weight um, pretty much along a parallel curve, but uh, they will continue to be heavier birds throughout. So um, I'm, not, I'm not saying egg size is not important, um, but uh, we need to if we're going to manage or manipulate or keep birds a little bit underweight uh, or overweight, we need to be aware of the implications on bird body weight and therefore on egg size. Now, I don't know, hopefully this is, this is a helpful exercise. I just wanna very quickly um, go through some calculations. And, and so if the point I'm, I'm making is not that you should or shouldn't um, bring in birds to maintain a slightly smaller weight, uh, egg weight to, to manage shell quality. That's a decision for, for you to make. But I, I want to impress upon you that even if, uh, even if we are reducing uh, bird body size to, to manage or limit egg size increases, um, we're still looking at a, a pretty um, substantial demand on, on the bird. So if we look at the management guide, and this is just from uh, one of the commercial management guides. Um, and for this particular strain at 95 weeks, the management guide says the hen will weigh about 1800 grams. 
Uh, she'll have produced about 438 eggs to that age. Uh, and at the, the management guide average egg weight, uh, that means 27.84 kilograms of eggs produced by that hen. So the egg output is about 15 and a half times the body weight. Now, just as an example, if we try to manage the birds to reduce um, egg size and we limit body weight uh, by 10%. So at 95 weeks uh, of age now, the birds are 1,620 grams. We assume that that wouldn't limit egg numbers, but we assume that that, 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 that would limit egg size. So a 10% decrease in average egg weight means that there's still 25 uh, kilograms of eggs being produced by that bird, which is because we've reduced things accordingly, still 15.5 times the body weight of that hen in total egg production. Now, I've kind of arbitrarily made up these numbers a little bit, but the point that I'm trying to show you is that even if we're reducing egg size uh, and, and hen body weight, it still is a huge nutrient demand on that hen over her productive life. And we still need to, to manage that. And of course, um, in Canada, the, the production cycle would be much shorter than 95 weeks, but the, the principle remains true. So even if we're reducing hen size and, and egg size, um, it's still a huge nutrient demand and we need to recognize that. So uh, if we look at birds coming into production at uh, 18 weeks of age, um, we want to make sure that they've got good body condition. And so it's not just about weight, it's also about fleshing. So if you look at the recommendation from, this is for Highline, um, other companies would probably have similar recommendations. Uh, we want those birds to have a certain amount of, of protein, um, and we can determine that by fleshing the birds, picking them up and feeling the keel and the muscle cover on the keel. So when the birds first come into production, we, we want them to be between two and three. As the birds get older, they will deposit more protein. And so we want to have a little bit more protein covered. And the reason is because we want those birds to have an appropriate body weight and uniformity and body composition so that they can respond to photostimulation at an appropriate physiological state. Now, what happens if those birds are underweight? And this is where we need to be careful managing birds to be a little bit underweight to manage egg size is we want them to have enough nutrient reserves because if we photostimulate them when they're not at an appropriate body weight and body composition is what we'll often see is this post peak check or this post peak dip. And what happens is the birds come in, they've got a relatively low appetite. They've got relatively low nutrient reserves because they're a little bit smaller than, than maybe they should be. They come into production and they burn through their nutrient reserves fairly rapidly. And so they don't necessarily go through a molt, but they take a bit of a break and that decreases egg production. Um, and as they then increase their feed intake, uh, they can replace some of those nutrient reserves. And so they do come back up in production, but they never quite reach the same, uh, they, they, they never quite reach their potential. So um, we wanna manage the pullets so that they've got good nutrient reserves, so that they've got a good appetite they're able to increase their feed intake and therefore their nutrient intake when the sudden demands of egg production start when they reach uh, sexual maturity. So again, remember egg size is dictated by bird size and those first eggs will be smaller from smaller pullets, but those smaller pullets are also going to have fewer nutrient reserves. Okay, so early on, uh, we tend to see smaller eggs. Um, now we can manipulate along that body or that egg size curve, we can manipulate egg size to a certain extent using some specific nutrients. So generally, if we feed a higher level of protein and in particular methionine and probably also lysine, um, we may be able to help those birds achieve a more rapid increase in, in early egg size. Um, now I'm gonna show a slide in a, a couple of minutes. Well, probably the, I think the next slide, um, talking about some of the limitations to this. Uh, linoleic acid is also an important nutrient. Um, the recommendations for layers is, if you look at the management guides, it's probably a little bit higher than 1%. Um, I don't think the literature supports um, more than 1%, but the management guides often have a, a, a minimum specification of 1%. 
mainly because the management guides are written for places where corn diets are fed and, and it's easy to achieve uh, more well over 1% linoleic acid in corn-based diets. Um, oh, my note is not coming in. Okay, so uh, in on the prairies where we feed generally wheat-based diets, uh, we can easily achieve this 1% linoleic acid with uh, with canola oil uh, supplementation at, at reasonable uh, levels. All right, so if we're looking at managing egg production and, and particularly egg size, uh, we find that protein has a major effect on egg size or egg weight. And if we look at this, uh, so this is increasing protein level uh, going towards the back of the graph. Uh, and you can see there's a relatively large impact on increasing dietary protein and, of course, dietary amino acids. But there's a relatively small effect on energy, uh, of, of energy on egg size. So there is some effect, um, but mostly we manipulate egg size through manipulating um, the protein and, and amino acids. If we look at egg production in terms of numbers, we see that protein has a relatively small effect on egg numbers, but quite a large uh, energy has quite a large effect on egg numbers. And so we want to make sure that the, the, the birds are not limited in energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. They're not limited in energy because that will uh, limit egg numbers. But we also want to make sure that they're not limited on protein and amino acids because uh, that will have a big impact on, on, egg, um, uh, on egg size. Now, again, we can change the, the dietary protein level and the dietary amino acid level somewhat to manipulate egg size, to limit the increase in uh, egg productions. And, and the primary breeders have, have done us a, a real favor by selecting for a genetic potential for a slower rate of intake. So um, this is probably becoming less of an issue uh, than it was in the past. Now, I want to say one thing about using nutrients to manipulate egg size um, or using energy to increase egg numbers. There are limits, okay? So as we go from a deficient level to a sufficient level, yes, we will see an increase in egg size. Or as we go from a deficient level to a sufficient level, uh, of energy, we may see an increase in egg numbers. But that line doesn't just keep going up and up and up. At a certain point, we reach an adequate level and there's no further response. So just keep that in mind that uh, if, you're, if you want more eggs, the secret may not be to just include more and more and more and more energy because there is a limit uh, to, how that, uh, uh, to how the bird will respond. Okay, so um, I mentioned that, that birds will tend to increase their body weight very gradually. So we're, we're going past um, the onset of sexual maturity. There's a little bit of continued rapid weight gain uh, as after the birds start laying. They're depositing fat. They're depositing protein. Uh, the oviduct is still growing. The ovaries are still growing. Um, and they're still developing some body weight, fat depots, and, and muscle deposition. But after about 24 weeks of age, uh, the, the rate of increase is actually very, very low. Now we need to keep that in mind as we're feeding birds for peak uh, production and for persistency. So I wanna take a step back and what drives the nutrient requirements? Because we want to feed the birds uh, and make sure that they're not limiting in nutrients uh, or not overly limiting if we're managing egg size. Um, so we need to know what the birds require. And there's really two big things that influence the nutrient and energy requirements of an individual bird. The first is the maintenance requirements. So for energy, for, um, for, for protein, and that's largely driven by body mass. So a bigger body means there's more body that needs to be maintained. There's more protein turnover. There's more energy that's required. Uh, so, Although there are increases in body weight after about 24 weeks, it's a very slow increase. And, slow, and, and so uh, there's a very slow increase in the maintenance requirements. Now, one thing that I'm not really going to get into, and I know the industry is moving towards more extensive housing, when the birds have more activity, you will need to feed more energy, probably a little bit more protein because there will be more activity and the bird will require more energy in particular to support that activity. 
The biggest driver, however, of nutrient requirements is the average daily egg mass produced by the birds. And that's uh, average egg weight on a particular day times the percent production on a particular day, or it can be on a weekly basis. Um, some of you might be calculating this on a case weight basis. So that's another way of, of looking at this. Um, but basically what, what happens with uh, average daily egg mass being a driver of nutrient requirements or a major driver of nutrient requirements is how the birds use their nutrients. Okay, so we can look at percent production and the birds will reach peak production. Um, this is from uh, the Lohman LSL Classic Management Guide. Um, other strains will probably be very similar. Uh, so peak production is reached at about 34 to 36 weeks of age. I mentioned that egg weight is going to increase uh, fairly rapidly early on, but then it becomes much more gradual. And by the end of the production cycle at 95 weeks or at 70 weeks, um, depending on your circumstances, egg size is still going up, but, but quite slowly. Now, if you multiply these two values together, you get average daily egg mass, okay? And that's the average amount of egg material that each hen is putting out on a daily basis. And really that's what dry, is driving uh, the nutrient requirements. And so the birds reach peak egg mass at a later age than they do peak egg production, okay? So if peak, excuse me, if egg mass is driving, is the main driver of nutrient requirements, we really need to be managing our diet phase changes based on when the birds are reaching peak egg mass. So nutrient requirements are probably going to be increasing or they will be increasing up to peak egg mass. And after that point, they will be decreasing because egg mass is going down and the birds require less uh, of, of nutrients and energy. And so if we're not reducing the nutrient composition or the, the nutrient concentration, particularly protein, um, we might see this egg weight line bump up a little bit because we're providing more, um, more protein, more amino acids than the birds actually need to produce an egg. So there's slow increases in body weight after 24 weeks of age, meaning that increase in body size has a relatively minor impact on the nutrient requirements as the bird gets older. And so the main driver, as I said, of changing nutrient requirements is average daily egg mass. And so as those birds get older, as they uh, gain a little bit of weight, but egg production goes down and because egg weight, individual egg weight, average egg weight is going up so slowly, we're actually seeing a decline in egg mass and therefore a decline in nutrient requirements. And that needs to be reflected in our uh, management of feed intake by the birds. Okay, so I want to change, uh, change gears a little bit and spend the rest of my time talking about something that I wasn't sure how to fit in, um, but I think uh, as we talk about peak production and as we talk about maintaining shell quality and egg size, uh, I think it fits in, and that's talking about phytase and laying hen diets. And, and in, in speaking to producers and speaking to nutritionists, I think there's a lot of um, questions about phytase in, in laying hen diets. Uh, so I just did a quick literature search. Um, so between 1991 and 2021, so today, um, there have been almost 2,500 broiler phytase papers published. Um, and if I look at laying hens or layers in phytase, there's about 594, 600. So there's a huge um, excess of broiler phytase papers than there is in laying hens. And there's a, a number of reasons for that, but really the, the implication is that in general, there's a, a lack of knowledge or a lack of appreciation for how phytase can be used in laying hen diets. And, and so um, what are some of the challenges? Well, there's, there's bone biology issues. Uh, a broiler trial is pretty easy to do. Um, we don't have this confounding effect of medullary bone that is deposited and mobilized on a 24 hour basis. Um, and so from that standpoint, it's much more straightforward talking about bone biology in, in broilers than it is in laying hens. Now, if we look at pullets, 
Um, because poets don't have medullary bone, um, this is some work that uh, Kuni Pongmani and I uh, did a few years ago. And in pullets, we see a nice response to phytase. So our positive control has um, uh, uh, the requirement for available phosphorus met uh, just with inorganic phosphorus. Uh, our negative control has phosphorus taken out to the level of available phosphorus that we expect to see liberated by phytase. And then as we add phytase into the diet, we actually see a response. And uh, this is what we would expect to see in a broiler trial. And in growing pullets, which uh, are not like broilers, but in terms of bone biology are somewhat similar to broilers, more so than laying hens, we do see uh, a phytase response. The other thing is laying hen difficult, uh, laying hen studies are difficult and expensive. Uh, and so if you look at the literature, most phytase papers in laying hens are over a very short period of time. And so there's a knowledge gap of the effect of phytase from either uh, the, the day that the pullets are placed to the end of a long laying cycle, or even from the start of a laying cycle to the end of a long laying cycle. And so um, that is one challenge uh, in terms of having confidence in the knowledge that's been published uh, and how to apply it into commercial laying hen production. Another challenge is that we feed laying hen diets uh, that are very high in calcium. And as we increase the amount of calcium in the diet, we increase the amount of calcium phytate complexes. Uh, and these phytate comp uh, calcium complexes are very difficult for phytase to break down. So uh, this is some work done uh, at the University of Maryland by Rosalina Angel. And uh, basically this is, these are solutions of calcium and phytate at different pHs. So at low pHs, and the, the resolution is quite poor, um, but at from two to about 3.5 pH, um, the, the calcium and the phytate remain in solution. But once the pH goes up, uh, the calcium and phytate precipitate together and essentially they're, um, uh, they're, they're poorly digestible even with, with phytase. So just for comparison, here's uh, broiler intestinal pH. And so this is in the gizzard uh, and you can see a pH of around, let's say two um, at these different ages. And there is an impact of uh, high limestone, in this case, one or 2% limestone. Um, there is an effect, a limited effect of uh, limestone inclusion on pH. With more limestone, pH goes up because uh, calcium can act as a buffer of, of pH. Now, if we look at laying hen diets, uh, and again, Around pH of two, there's still uh, uh, the calcium and phytate are in solution. The phytate is subject to degradation by the phytase. If we look at laying hens, so again, looking at the gizzard, um, the gizzard pH is much higher. So instead of around two, it's up around four, four and a half. Uh, and so with high levels of, of uh, calcium, high levels of limestone, so 7.7 to 8.25% limestone, we're starting to be in the range where there's a lot more precipitation of calcium and phytate, a lot more degradation, uh, sorry, a lot more um, limiting of the availability of phytase to work. So that doesn't mean phytase won't work, it just means that at high levels of calcium, phytase is less effective. Now, I think we're starting to understand that we're probably feeding too much calcium and I don't want people to go out and suddenly reduce their calcium. But what I'm saying is we need to research, are the recommendations actually recommendations or requirements or are they just numbers that, well, if a little is good, more must be better. So without calling into question the management guides, well, I'm gonna call into question the management guides. In terms of calcium and phosphorus, I think that the management guides are not actually requirements. And so if you're familiar with Pirates of the Caribbean, they're like the Pirates Code. They're not so much guidelines or rules, or sorry, they're, they're more guidelines than actual rules. So I wanna show some examples just very quickly in the last few minutes uh, of how this works. So a typical phytase trial, we has our, have our positive control. 
which contains the breeder recommendation levels of calcium and phosphorus. We have our negative control, which is that same diet, except we remove calcium and phosphorus uh, and we decrease it by the, the matrix value of the phytate. So how much phytate, uh, sorry, how much calcium and phosphorus do we expect to be liberated when we add phytase to that diet? And then we have various uh, levels of phytase that we add or various sources of phytase that we add to the negative control diet. And really what we want to see is a decrease in some aspect of performance, shell quality or egg production or so on in our negative control because the birds are limiting in calcium and phosphorus. When we increase the amount of calcium and phosphorus available to the bird by adding phytase, we want to see a return to that positive control level. Well, the problem is that the negative control diet, because the recommendations from primary breeders are beyond the actual requirements, is there's actually no effect of the negative control diet or very little control, uh, very little effect of the negative control diet. And so we've seen that in numerous experiments. So we have our positive control diet, our negative control diet, and then negative control plus various levels of phytase, absolutely no effect on egg production. Uh, if we look at eggshell thickness, um, no effect on eggshell thickness. So our negative control diet isn't actually reducing the eggshell quality. Uh, if we look at egg production, this is from a different study, maybe a very slight decrease in, in egg production over uh, a, a relatively long um, production cycle. But again, nothing really dramatic. So this suggests that, that the birds are able to handle that decrease in, the, in calcium and available phosphorus um, in the negative control diet without really having any negative effects on, on production and, or shell quality. Now, what we did find is that um, when we feed the negative control diet, so this slight reduction, uh, there's a little bit of a reduction in body weight, uh, a little bit of a reduction, although not significant in bone, uh, structural bone area. But overall, really, the birds can handle that reduction in available phosphorus and, and calcium meaning that they're, they're, the recommendations are actually higher than the birds need. So we've started taking a little bit different approach. And so we have our positive control or negative control like we would otherwise, but then we also have a negative control to diet. And so we reduce uh, calcium and available phosphorus quite substantially. So more than the matrix value. And then we add phytase to look for uh, a, a, re, uh, a response. Um, and so really, uh, ideally, what we would do is, is base our positive control diets on the actual calcium and, and available phosphorus requirements. So that's a, a slightly different approach. Now, when we take this approach in our research, what we see is, in fact, our negative control to diet reduces shell quality in terms of specific gravity. Our negative control diet uh, to diet decreases breaking strength. And now when we add the phytase, there's a response and we see um, the, uh, the, the eggshell quality when we add phytase to that negative control two diet um, coming back to uh, where we would want it to be based on our positive control. So why does it matter? Well, um, I think it's really important to know that I think we're overfeeding phosphorus, available phosphorus. So this is some old work. Um, back in the 80s, but what they found uh, was that the best shell quality in the birds was at 0.4 to 0.5 total phosphorus. So they didn't re report available phosphorus based on their diet composition. I estimated about 0.2 to 0.3% available phosphorus. Uh, and although they, when they fed limited total phosphorus, there was a decrease in uh, feed intake and shell quality, the breeder recommendations, the current breeder recommendations are about 0.43%. So uh, in this research, the best shell quality was at a much lower available phosphorus level than is currently recommended by the, by the primary breeders. So I don't have the best rock solid um, ironclad requirement values. I know that there are research groups, including my own, working on trying to establish what a reasonable level of available phosphorus is. Um, I think that we can probably uh, increase the efficacy of uh, phytase use by not overfeeding calcium. 
Um, and so those are some things that I'll talk about in, uh, in the next talk in, in the coming months. Okay, so just to summarize, do I think phytase, do I think phytase works in laying hen diets? Yes, yes I do. Um, do you need to adjust your dietary available phosphorus levels and, and probably also your calcium levels when feeding phytase? Absolutely, yes. Um, what happens if you don't increase, uh, adjust your dietary available phosphorus and calcium levels? Well, first of all, you're increasing your feed cost. The birds, if you're not making any changes to your diet and you're just adding phy uh, phytase on top, you're increasing your feed costs. You're feeding too much inorganic phosphorus. Inorganic phosphorus is expensive. So you're feeding too much inorganic phosphorus, it's costing you money. And then you're adding phytase, which is also costing you money on top of that. So if you're not going to adjust your dietary available phosphorus levels down when you feed a phytase, there's absolutely no point in feeding phytase because the birds already have enough available phosphorus if you're feeding the primary breeder recommended levels. Now, there are also potential negative implications because if you're adding phytase to a diet that doesn't really need it, you're probably still liberating more phosphorus. And what that's going to do is increase blood phosphorus levels. Um, and I didn't point it out in that graph, but as blood phosphorus levels increased, shell quality came down. So you're not only costing yourself money, you're probably also losing money uh, because of decreased shell quality. Now, again, I, I think we're probably feeding too much calcium for I mentioned optimum phytase effic efficacy here, um, but I think we're probably also feeding too much, avail uh, too much calcium based on what the birds actually require. So I think this is something that we need to, to spend a lot of time and, and effort on really quantifying, uh, knowing what the calcium requirements are, knowing what the available phosphorus requirements are, and then we can start using phytase more effectively. Okay, so um, to, to summarize then, uh, feeding to peak and beyond, uh, you want to start with a uniform flock. That is going to begin with pullet management and nutrition. Uh, you can manipulate egg size somewhat. A lot of that is going to be done with your pullet management. When the birds enter production at a smaller body weight, uh, they're going to tend to lay smaller eggs. Now, there is a fine line between managing egg size and reducing egg size to the point where you lose money because you're not producing eggs uh, that the market demands. The other problem with smaller hens entering production is that there will be a risk of uh, the birds having inadequate nutrient reserves, having low intake and not being able to sustain that high levels of uh, those high levels of production, and they may not have good peak production and good persistency of production. When you make your diet changes, make them based on the nutrient requirements of the bird, which are going to be driven largely by the average daily egg mass, uh, and make those changes not on the age of the bird, not on percent production, but on the average daily egg mass. Sorry, that is a slide that was duplicated. Okay, so... Um, we want to also take in, uh, keep in mind the nutrient intake. So birds require a certain amount of each nutrient per day, not a percent of the diet. So as feed intake goes up, you want to decrease the nutrient density so that at different levels of feed intake, the birds are still uh, uh, obtaining the same level of nutrients. Now, uh, phytase can, can be used effectively in laying hen diets as long as you make appropriate dietary adjustments. Um, so if you're going to feed phytase, you have to reduce your available phosphorus uh, at least by the amount of uh, the matrix value for available phosphorus. And if you're a little bit skeptical or a little bit nervous, that's a good place to start. So simply reduce your available phosphorus, uh, reduce the phosphorus that you're adding as dicalcium phosphate or monocal by the amount of the matrix value. And look at your performance. Um, if you're comfortable with that, then try dropping it a little bit more. Uh, I think there's substantial room to decrease available phosphorus supply in laying hen diets and still gain the, the advantage of using phytase without having a negative effect on performance. 
All right, so that went uh, a little bit longer than um, my last few uh, webinars, but um, I think we still have some time for questions. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. All right, thanks, Doug. You gave us a lot to talk about or think about in that one. I really appreciate that. Um, I just want to remind folks that if you have questions, please uh, enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the, the screen. You also have an opportunity to upvote any of the questions are there, that are there. So if there's a question that you were thinking of, uh, if you just click on the little thumbs up uh, on in that question box there, uh, it will move the question up in the in the rank and we'll be more likely, uh, we'll have the time to, to get it answered. Um, so Doug, you did uh, cover this again, uh, or cover this in your presentation, but, um, and, and this question was asked um, just prior to, to you covering it in your presentation. But uh, maybe I'll ask it again for those who might have missed it or need a little bit uh, more information. Uh, what nutrients in a diet influence egg size the most and in what order, assuming that birds are at the re required body weight or slightly over? Yeah, that, that's, that's really what people want to know. And I, I almost purposely didn't get into it because a lot of the work that's been done looking at the influence of, for example, egg size and linoleic acid has been in the context of those genetic strains where there is a big increase in egg size quite rapidly. So I'm not sure we currently have a good handle on it. Now, if you have a problem, if the birds are at the right, the right body size and body composition, and you're still seeing a limited egg size, or the eggs are not where you want them to be, um, the first thing I would do is increase, well, first of all, check your linoleic acid level. Um, usually in a laying hen diet, we have to add a reasonable amount of oil uh, to get over that dilution effect of all the calcium, all the limestone that we're adding, because the birds require a lot of calcium. So it would be rare in a practical laying hen diet for the birds to be deficient in linoleic acid. So that's not where I would look to um, affect egg size. I would look to, to protein and in particular, not just protein in general, but particular methionine, but also lysine. So if your egg size is lagging a little bit from where you want to see it, um, increase, increase methionine, increase lysine just a little bit and look for a response. The advantage of the primary breeders selecting for that very slow increase in egg size is the implications of overfeeding um, on lysine and methionine are less than they were in the past. How much less? I don't know. I don't think we've got a good handle on that yet. Um, so th that's, that's where I would start. Um, look at what you're feeding for lysine and, and methionine. And if your egg size is a little bit bigger, uh, smaller than you want it to be increased. Um, the challenge in the past was that once you started increasing egg size, it was almost impossible to pull it back to get a decrease in egg size because the curve was just going up. And if you were reducing amino acids and protein to try and reduce egg size, you would actually reduce egg numbers. There is a point where if you reduce protein too much amino acids, you will reduce um, egg, uh, egg numbers. But with the flatter egg size curve, um, I think they're probably going to be less sensitive to that. Okay, I I think you've answered this, but I'm just um, the there's a sort of a, a additional question. So just to clarify, um, in high protein wheat diets where you're balancing amino where balancing amino acids is difficult, would you formulate on amino acids and ignore crude protein level? Or yep. would you watch the crude protein level and supplement with crystalline, lysine, methionine, threonine uh, to their requirements of the, at that age? No, I generally formulate experimental diets. I don't formulate commercial diets. Um, and so I, I need to be careful what I'm, how I'm, I'm presenting this. When I'm formulating my research diets, I generally don't put a restriction on, on crude protein. And I also formulate um, to at least three or four, the first three or four limiting amino acids and supplement accordingly. Um, the, we are getting more and more 
synthetic amino acids available. Um, so it is possible, if not practical just yet, to formulate to easily four and possibly five limiting amino acids. So I think we can take advantage of that and decrease our total crude protein um, in the context of, of environment um, and uh, ammonia and, and nitrogen pollution. Um, there's probably going to be pushes to decrease crude protein as well. So um, yeah, with, with strategic supplementation um, of, of synthetic amino acids, you can come up with cost-effective diets that are wheat-based diets that are lower in protein. Cool, good. Thank you, Doug. And one thing I just want to add is, you know, if you look at the older literature where they talk about the effect of protein on, uh, on egg size, really what they're talking about is in those studies, probably methionine. Um, and I think we're gaining an appreciation for the effect of lysine on egg size as well. So when you read the older literature talking about the effect of protein on egg size, it's still mostly about methionine and, and probably lysine. That leads so nicely into my next question. Uh, there's a theory that a bird eats to it, its methionine levels. Uh, so if that's true, uh, you could lower the methionine and that would increase feed intake, resulting in higher nutrient intakes, in turn resulting in higher production and egg weight. What do you think? That's a good question. Um... Is, is this idea that they eat to their methionine levels, is that a proven thing or is, I mean, you just said, you know, in older literature, there's some of this um, notion. Mm -hmm. uh, is it? Yeah, so, so we used to kind of assume that birds ate to their energy requirement. And once they reached their energy requirement, they'd stop eating. Um, birds have an appetite for calcium and they will increase feed intake if they don't have enough calcium. Um, they will increase their intake if they don't have enough methionine. Now, all of this, laying hen diets are kind of weird in the animal world because very high levels of calcium, which contains no energy, um, which means we have to add a lot of fat or you know, a higher amount of fat than we would in, in other types of diets often. Um, and there's that impact of, of lysine, methionine. Uh, and so um, the, the short answer is it's a great question and I don't know the answer. And it, the other thing is that we're dealing with genetics that are very, very different than the classical work that was done even 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or you know, looking at those egg production curves and, and egg size curves from 1980. So you know, uh, 40 years ago. Um, Yeah, basically anything you can do to increase, particularly in the pullets, increase feed intake, um, increase body size up to a point is probably helpful. Um, when the birds are producing, you want to don't you don't just want to increase feed intake. You want to look at what are they getting the nutrients they need. Are they getting the calcium? Are they getting the energy? linoleic acid and, and methionine. So it, it's a long-winded answer, and I'm not sure it, it does a good job answering the question, but I don't, short answer is I don't know. So Doug, you, uh, you know, when this statement is made that birds eat to their methionine levels, are, is that birds eat to their methionine levels in lay? So if you were to do something, you know, um, manipulate the methionine levels, uh, as you suggested in the pullet phase, um, would it have the same kind of effect in terms of increasing feed intake? Do you know? I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Maybe that's something it's I'll look into for the, the next one. It's interesting, you know, to, it, to see if we could manipulate on a sort of a nutrient by nutrient uh, uh, basis and, and uh, have some effect on feed intake. So uh, the other thing that I, it's not a question here, but you talked about they'll eat for their calcium level. So in, in the material that you've just presented, it seems like we're overfeeding calcium um, and sort of trying to fight that battle of making sure they eat enough. So perhaps in this reducing calcium, as you've proposed, we might have some beneficial effect. Yeah, and, and so um, I, I'm very confident that we're overfeeding available phosphorus. 
I'm reasonably confident that we're overfeeding uh, calcium. Um, the problem is that, you know, we've always kind of viewed calcium as being inert. You know, we can add a bunch of calcium and it really doesn't do any harm. And to a certain extent, that's probably true. Um, but if we're looking at uh, reducing our, um, uh, reducing our uh, environmental footprint in terms of phosphorus pollution by feeding phytase, feeding high levels of calcium are going to reduce the efficacy. Now, of course, we need to feed high levels of calcium because of the demands for eggshell quality. But I think we've, we've become comfortable with this idea that calcium is inert and it doesn't affect anything else. Um, but high levels of calcium decrease shell quality. High levels of calcium decrease bone quality. And now I'm talking about really, really high levels. So what I'm saying is we need to take another look at what are the actual calcium requirements? What are the actual available phosphorus requirements? How do we use phytase to, um, to reduce phosphorus pollution, reduce diet costs? Um, and calcium is going to be a big part of that equation. So um, yeah, for sure. If there's For any sure. funders out there listening, I'm uh, I've got some I've got lots of ideas about uh, calcium and phosphorus requirements. There's work to be done in that area for sure. Um, so just continuing on that, uh, it says, do you think that we uh, can say uh, say where the calcium and available phosphorus required numbers are at at this point? And additionally. Not really, I don't think you just said that. We need more research. Um, and additionally, since phytase is much cheaper as of recent, if one is to reduce calcium and phosphorus levels, should they increase the phytase levels added to the diets, i.e. superdosing uh, a layer? Yeah, superdosing is a lot more well developed in, in broilers. Um, and I think there's there's good evidence in support of it, um, as long as it's it's economical. Um, in layers. I think, I think there's enough literature out there that says between 0.2 and 0.3% available phosphorus uh, is, is sufficient for the birds. And, and these are, are in long-term layer studies. Uh, and so what that means is you can eliminate most of your inorganic phosphorus. So dical, monocal, phosphate, um, whatever you're using. If you're feeding, if you're feeding phytase, and so that's going to decrease phosphorus pollution. It's going to decrease diet costs, um, especially with the cost of phytase coming down. So um, I'm fairly confident that you can have substantial reductions in available phosphorus relative to what the management guide says. Um, calcium is a little bit more. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why that is. So in a phytase experiment, we know phytase liberates phosphorus. We know phytate liberates calcium. But if you reduce your available phosphorus, or if you reduce your available phosphorus coming from the diet by 0.15%, the matrix value of many phytases, that's a big drop in relative to the total phosphorus in the diet, okay? If you decrease calcium by the matrix value, 0.15, 0.16% um, in a diet that contains 4% calcium, that's a drop in the bucket. So when, when we do our experiments and we drop calcium by that matrix value, it's, it's a small decrease and we see no effect on performance. The question is, how much more can we drop it? And, and that work hasn't been done. Um, I just want to thank Doug. I just want to draw everyone's attention. Um, Matt Orshak, it's a Matt's a graduate student with uh, Dr. Korver. Uh, he just um, uh, posted in the chat box that uh, if you're interested in amino acids for laying hens, there's a really good article in poultry science um, in regards to that, and it's open access, so you can you can access that. Uh, continuing on with the amino acid discussion, though, uh, there is a question about uh, how does the influence of amino acids uh, on egg size affect the quality of the eggshell and by extension, uh, chick quality in broiler breeders? So now we're kind of switching gears, but um, definitely uh, an important topic. Yeah, so we don't generally worry as much about shell quality in broiler breeders because the birds are bigger. They have bigger um, 
greater nutrient reserves, egg size as a proportion of body weight is much smaller, and they lay a lot fewer eggs. So the demand on the system is a lot less. So um, in terms of chick quality and amino acid levels, that's uh, I'm thinking back, um, it's, there's a, a, it's a bell-shaped response. So if you're underfeeding amino acids, uh, you tend to see a decrease in chick hatch weight. As you increase that level, you see an increase in chick hatch weight. But if you keep increasing the level of protein, you, you see a decrease in hatch weight again. Um, and I'd have to go back and look at some of the literature that talks about the longer term implications. So the, the things that we talk about with increasing egg size in laying hens do translate to egg size in broiler breeders. Um, but we also have that extra uh, piece about chick quality. Now, if we're talking about uh, amino acids increasing egg size and the effect on shell quality in general in laying hens, as the eggs get bigger and bigger, remember after peak egg production, um, the, the oviduct is, is really essentially mature. Uh, and so there's no further gain in the ability to deposit calcium carbonate onto the egg. So you have an egg that's this big and you've got a fixed amount of shell, um, you might have a good shell quality, but if you've got an egg that's this big and you've got the same number of grams of shell material, it has to be thinner in order to cover that entire larger egg. So that's, that's where the loss in shell quality comes from. And I think I mentioned this early on in, in the talk that the biggest factor in allowing long-term egg production. So those long laying cycles, hundred weeks plus, is that limited increase in egg size or rate of increase because that limits the loss of shell quality or the rate of loss of shell quality because of the increasing egg size. Good, thanks, Doug. Um, so with that, I think we've answered uh, all of the questions. Uh, there's a bit of a discussion uh, again in the in the chat box if you want to look. But just going back to that comment about uh, methionine, um, Matt uh, says here that in that article regarding the total amino or all the amino acids, uh, it suggests that the that feed intake in hens is actually negatively cor correlated to total sulfur amino acids. So it's not just methionine, but some of the other amino acids as well. Um, sulfur amino acids. Um, okay, so I, with, oh, I think we have one more question. So, uh, okay, one more question. If you've got time, Doug, um, folks, sure. it's after 12 o'clock. Uh, if you need to go, we completely understand. Again, all of this will be available uh, in the recording, but there is one more question here. So I, let's ask it. And um, it, I know you promised to cover bone development in the next webinar. However, what are your thoughts on feeding the birds optimal levels of uh, calcium and phosphorus or minerals in the pre-laying diet, bone development phase, and later reduce the levels we are currently feeding throughout the remainder of the bird's life? Um, P.S. I'm really looking forward to the next uh, webinar. Thanks. So. Yeah, so, so you know, I... The, the bone quality side of things is really kind of something that fascinates me. And so I talked about in the previous webinars, a little bit about bone development. So to just summarize, we want the birds to develop a sound skeletal structure because we know that um, first of all, uh, the birds need that skeletal support to maintain a high level of egg production. When birds lose, uh, bone structural integrity, that's when they run into things like cage layer fatigue, broken keels, particularly in uh, extensive housing, um, uh, loss of shell quality. And so skeletal development is important. We know that as the birds approach sexual maturity, they stop depositing structural bone and they start depositing medullary bone. And that medullary bone is intended as a, a source to support eggshell formation in the night when birds are not consuming feed, they're not absorbing as, as much uh, calcium directly from the diet. So we want to maximize or optimize the amount of structural bone before they start developing sexually. We want to optimize or maximize the deposition of medullary bone uh, because it provides a nice protective cover for the structural bone. 
And then as the birds get older, they will gradually lose both, well, they will gradually lose structural bone. And in the next talk, I'll explain why. Um, but they will also continue to deposit medullary bone. So um, with reduced egg production, there is less demand on the system, um, but it's, um, it's still a very important part of that whole calcium economy in the bird. Intake, deposition into medullary bone, and use for uh, shell quality. So I could probably go for another hour on that. <laughs> so uh, th th that's just the, the basics and I will be covering it in the, in the next webinar. So 